Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you remotely. And um, for those of you who have seen us do this, we're trying to keep tweaking the technology, get better uh, every day. By the way, someone said living and managing in the age of COVID-19 is like flying a plane while you're building it or the other way around. In that case, a really innovative guy. I know that's a corny transition, but he's innovating, innovating every day. He's Dr. Brian Strom, Chancellor of Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences and Executive Vice President of Health Affairs at Rutgers University. Good to see you, Dr. Strom. Pleasure to see you as always. Um, let's talk innovation. A couple things at Rutgers. Number one, there is a take-home saliva test that's been approved. What is it and why does it matter so much? I, we, we think, obviously, we're biased, but we, we think it is an enormous, important contribution. And, and it's really two parts, at, at least. One is uh, the tradi uh, um, three parts. The traditional way you do tests, they're done one at a time. You hear people talking about test kits and not enough test kits. Um, the technology that has been developed by, um, uh, by um, um, Andy Brooks and, and Jay Tishfield at Rutgers, New Brunswick, um, can do 10,000 tests a day. And we are- 10, a day, and we are with support from the state, elevating that to 50,000 tests a day. So an enormous improvement from a, it, it not, only a few weeks ago, the state was only doing 7,000 tests per day across the entire state. We can now do, within a week or two, we'll be able to do 50,000 tests a day just in this one lab. Second major advance is the normal way you get to COVID testing is very invasive and uncomfortable, having to take what amounts to a Q-tip put it all the way in your nose, very deep, all the way in your mouth, very deep. For uncomfortable sampling, the person who does the sampling has to be in full protective gear in the process. It takes a while to do it. Uh, we just, this is done by spitting in a cup. And we just did this yesterday. We just tested it on 800 of our students who are right. going into the back of the wards. In seven and a half hours, uh, we did 800 students. So it was less than a minute a student. Um, to be able to get the, these tests. The third major advance is they now have the ability to do it as a home kit. So you can mail it, it can be shipped to your home, you spit in a cup and ship it back. Um, and so, so in many ways, this is an enormous opportunity and advance to be able to, to in, increase COVID testing, uh, which is key to economically opening up uh, for the state. You know, as a Rutgers alum, I remember what life was like in New Brunswick back in the day. And <laughs> 50,000 plus students overall, doctor? Uh, we're now about 70,000, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how long ago it was. Uh, yeah, and by the way, every campus, Rutgers, Newark, New Brunswick, Camden, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that being said, 70,000, okay, play this out. We're doing this yeah. on the 16th of June, be seen later. How challenging is it to have 70,000 students, some of whom will be in classrooms, lecture halls, et cetera, some will be online, dorms, protective, social distancing mask. You talk to me, can we predict what it looks like in the fall of 2020 into the winter? So we can certainly predict whether the predictions are correct or of course it'll be a different story. <clears throat> but we, we have been undergoing an enormous process now over a number of months of planning for what we'll do this summer and what we'll do in the fall. Um, it will differ by campus, it'll differ by school, uh, it'll, it'll differ in different situations. So for example, um, the football team has now returned to campus. Um, they were given uh, these mail order test kits before they came. Uh, in fact, two people were positive, so they were told not to come. Um, and the rest will stay completely isolated, living in an attack facility just with themselves and their coaches, uh, and will be tested, I don't remember, once or twice a week in addition to maintain. So for that very controlled environment, they have a lot of physical contact. They play with each other. They'll be playing with other people. Uh, when they go to play games, there'll be no audience. Um, they, they, no fans. Yeah, no fans. On TV, filmed, but no fans in, in, in the stadium. And, and so it's a, um, that's a very different situation. Um, and key to, to the theme here is targeted. Very different situation than, for example, uh, our research. We basically stopped all of our laboratory research. Um, because of the need for social distancing, we're now restarting it again. We're restarting it slowly, gradually between now and September. Um, the people who wanted to come back to work first were asked to take saliva tests before they came back. And they'll come back, we're guessing maybe at 50% capacity in, in June, maybe 75% capacity during the summer and 100% over, over September. 
wearing masks, weekly tests, um, uh, staying six feet away, re remote uh, social distancing. One of my colleagues prefers to call it physical distancing, an actual better term, because that's really the issue. You don't have to be socially isolated. You need to be physically apart from each other. Um, and and so, the, so the researchers are being brought back that way. The classrooms, uh, to the degree there are big lecture rooms, they'll be done remotely. To the degree the classes need to be on site, like some of our clinical classes need to be on site. Where do masks fit in? Dr. Uh, Snow, where do masks fit in? Everybody on present, everybody on site wears masks. Anybody physically present wears a mask. And Inside, in, outside, what? Uh, everywhere. If you're going to be on campus, you wear a mask. Um, it's more important inside. When people go into buildings, we'll track who's in the building. So if somebody gets sick, we know who is there, who is with them, so we can identify tracing, uh, identifying the, the people with them. So it's going to dramatically change the character of the university. Dorms will not be fully occupied. They will be used, as they are now, for foreign students, for out-of-state students, for uh, students who don't have other homes to be able to go to. But people who can commute will be asked to keep commuting in order to, again, remote distancing, uh, you know, re social distancing, keeping pe people apart. It, it will be a different kind of experience, but yet nicely, you know, we shifted suddenly to teaching remotely, as you know, obviously in the spring, and the, the feedback from the students, the ratings of those classes were actually even higher than the ratings of the classes before. Mm. So, so it's you know, worked. You know, it's interesting. The one thing that you and I talked about recently on a podcast that, that we did for our colleagues at MD Advantage, we were talking about a whole range of issues. And I did ask you about the vaccine issue. Now I'm going to ask you again in this forum. The term vaccine is a tricky term because for many, it means a cure-all. What does it mean to you? Vaccine is, is not a cure-all. Um, there's really only three ways this epidemic, pandemic, can end. <clears throat> Two of them are herd immunity. The third I'll talk about in a minute. Um, one way of getting herd immunity is if 50 to 70% of the population gets the disease. Given we're talking about a disease that so far has been killing 6% of the people who've been getting it in New Jersey, um, that's probably a high estimate because we don't know everybody who got sick, but, but been killing a lot of people, even people who don't get killed, get very sick. You don't want to go that way if you don't have to. Second way you develop herd immunity is with a vaccine. You, you take an injection of something, and we can talk about that, that something, and that if that gives people immunity and enough immunity, then instead of them getting the disease, they get the immunity from the vaccine. That clearly is the best way to proceed here, if, mm -hmm. if, we, if we can. Um, third way is if we can't get to herd immunity, either by a vaccine or by infection or because antibodies uh, don't work, then ultimately the hope is over years, the pandemic will burn out because over time, viruses tend to get less serious. So we're gonna be right back right after this. I'm Steve Adubato. Thanks for watching. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, MD Advantage Insurance Company, New Jersey Sharing Network, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, TD Bank, Summit City MD, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, and by the Adler Aphasia Center. Promotional support provided by Jaffe Communications and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association.